humans are pretty good at explaining away evidence of things they just don't want to believe in that's why we have holocaust deniers even though there are dozens of concentration camps and people who survived it we have flat earthers even though the earth looks like this we have atheists and we have jesus myths it's one thing to be skeptical about Jesus' virgin birth or his resurrection, but to be skeptical of his existence, to think that Christianity exploded in the first century without an actual person named Jesus to set things in motion? How do historians know Jesus existed? In this video, I'll be giving 10 reasons to know Jesus actually existed. Before that, how do historians know that a certain event occurred? There are several criteria they use, but I'm going to talk about only two in this video. As the historians Dr. Likona and Gary Habermas write, an event is considered highly probable to be historical if that event has early and independent attestation. When an event or saying is attested by more than one independent source, there is a strong indication of historicity. It is important to determine whether the source is really independent. Suppose a friend told you of a crime he had witnessed. You told someone else who in turn told a third person. There wouldn't be three independent sources for the accident, but only one. However, if your friend and his brother both witnessed the crime and both told you about it, you would have two independent sources. Let's say an election went on in the United States and at the end of the day, reporters at the US working for BBC, ABN, CBC, CNN, TV3, DW are all reporting that Trump won the election. Even those who aren't at the US, who do you think won the election? Trump, right? You just use the multiple attestation criterion to answer that question. Multiple independent sources talking about the same event indicate authenticity. Another criterion for historicity is the attestation by enemies. If a testimony affirming an event or saying is given by a source who doesn't sympathize with a person, message or cause that profits from the account, we have an indication of authenticity. An enemy generally is not considered to be biased in favor of a certain person, message or cause. Now with that out of the way, let's talk about those reasons. Reason number one, early creeds refer to Jesus. The Asian didn't have our tools for recording and passing along information. Tape recorders, social media were non-existent, and the individual copies that could be made by hand could not reach many, for few people knew how to read, so they relied on oral tradition to teach others. Creeds were a popular means to pass along important information in a format friendly to memorization. They were used for learning and stating faith and doctrine. A good example is the Apostles' Creed which many of us have recited at one time or another. One of the earliest and most important creed is quoted in Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church, which he received probably from Peter and James when he visited them in Jerusalem. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 to 5, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. According to the prominent New Testament scholar James Dunn, this creed goes all the way back to only a few months after Jesus' death. Other creeds are found in Philippians 2 verse 5 to 11, Romans 10 9, etc. The key question is, why would there be ancient creeds about Jesus if he never existed in the first place? Hmm. Reason number two. Cornelius Tacitus wrote about Jesus. Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman historian, reports Nero fasting the guilt of burning of Rome and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for the abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. So from this, we can deduce that there were early Christians in Rome, Pontius Pilate, Jesus and his crucifixion, and Rome got burnt. Reason number three, Gaius Suetonius mentions Jesus. Suetonius was also a Roman historian who wrote during the early imperial era of the Roman Empire. 
In his work, Lives of the Twelve Kaisers, he wrote, he expelled from Rome the Jews, constantly making disturbances at the instigation of Christus. Louis H. Feldman, in his work, The Jewish Life and Thought Among Greeks and Romans, states that most scholars assume that in this reference Jesus is meant and that the disturbances mentioned were due to the spread of Christianity in Rome. Number 4. Flavius Josephus refers to Jesus. Josephus, a first century Jewish historian and ancient writer, affirms that James, the brother of Jesus, was martyred. In his work Antiquities, he wrote, Festus was now dead, and the Albinus was but upon the road. So he, and Anus the high priest, assembled the Sanhedrin of the judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Now, wait a minute. Why would a Jewish historian be talking about Jesus' brother if Jesus was just an imaginary character? Reason number five. Lucian of Samosata wrote about Jesus. Lucian of Samosata was a Greek satirist who lived during the latter half of the second century. He is a reliable source because he was hostile to Christianity and so would have no reason to help Christians. In his work, The Person of Peregrinus, he wrote, the Christians you know worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. Greek historians talking about Jesus and his crucifixion? Number 6. The Jewish Talmud mentions Jesus. The Talmud commonly refers to a compilation of ancient teachings regarded as sacred by Jews. In terms of his teachings, Jesus was called a fool in the Talmud as a result of his claim of being the son of God. The Talmud also asserts that Jesus was an idolater, particularly in the section that makes most mentions of Jesus, Psalm 103. Here is an example. Neither shall any plague come nigh your tent. In other words, you shall have no son or disciple who burns his food publicly, like Jesus the Nazarene. And its tradition, on the eve of Passover, Yeshu, the Nazarene, was hung. Quick question, why would the sacred text of Jews be talking about Jesus' crucifixion if he didn't exist? Hmm. Number 7. Jesus mentioned by a Maraba Serapian. Serapian was a stoic philosopher from the Roman province of Syria. He is noted for a letter he wrote in Aramaic to his son who was named Serapian. The letter was composed some time after 73 AD, but before the 3rd century. The letter may be an early non-Christian reference to the crucifixion of Jesus. In his letter, he wrote, What advantage did the men of Samos gain from burning Pythagoras? In a moment, their land was covered with sand. What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? Bruce Kilton, scholar of early Christianity and Judaism, states that Bar-Serapian's reference to the king of Jews may be related to the inscription on the cross of Jesus' crucifixion as recorded in the Gospel of Mark. Number 8. Clement of Rome wrote about Jesus. Clement was martyred in AD 98 for his belief in Jesus and his willingness to spread his belief to many as possible. This makes Clement an early source and he talked about the ministry of the disciples, Jesus and the resurrection. He may have been the Clement to whom Paul refers in Philippians 4 verse 3. In his letter to the Corinthian church, Clement wrote, Therefore, having received orders and complete certainty caused by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and believing in the word of God, they went with the Holy Spirit's certainty, preaching the good news that the kingdom of God is about to come. Clement affirms Jesus' assistance very clearly. What makes Clement even more significant is that Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Jerome record that Clement was personally ordained by the Apostle Peter. He was a disciple of Peter. Peter, in turn, was a disciple of Jesus, meaning that Clement had access to reliable testimony. Reason number 9. Ignatius of Antioch wrote about Jesus. Ignatius of Antioch was an early Christian writer and bishop of Antioch. From Jerome's Chronicon, Bishop Irenaeus writes that John the Apostle survived all the way to the time of Trajan, after whom his notable disciples were Papias, Bishop of Heropolis, 
Polycarp of Smyrna and Ignatius of Antioch. From this, it is believed that Ignatius was a student of the Apostle John. Like Clement, this implies a personal relationship with an original disciple, making first-hand testimony available to him. He wrote extensively on the historical Jesus in his letter to the Trallians, Smyrnians, and Magnesians. He reinforced early Christian beliefs in the letters he wrote while in prison. Ignatius refused to recount his fate in the face of death. Hardly something someone would do for an imaginary character of history. Reason number 10. The Epistles of Apostle Paul This is where we will be referring to the New Testament for the first time. When we appeal to the New Testament, we are not assuming inspiration or even the general reliability of the New Testament in our case for Jesus' existence. We are only regarding the New Testament as an ancient volume of literature containing 27 separate books and letters. Paul is a source independent of the original disciples. We know of several documents that Paul wrote himself, some of which predate the Gospels by a decade or so years. Paul places Jesus in the historical context. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4, we read about Jesus that he was buried and was raised. Jesus' existence, crucifixion, and resurrection is affirmed throughout all Paul's genuine undisputed epistles. Paul indicated that he knew the historical Jesus was meek and gentle and that he came from a poor family or lived a poor life or both, as called a poor Barnett state. There can be no doubt both before he was a disciple but also afterwards, Paul knew a lot about the historical Jesus. You can go through all these sources and still deny Jesus' existence. I just don't have that kind of faith, plus it is unreasonable. Before you reject Jesus' existence, just know that there are more reliable sources of Jesus than Tiberius Caesar, the Roman Emperor. As Justin Bass notes in his book, The Bedrock of Christianity, Tiberius was the most powerful man in the world of his day. Jesus was one of the poorest, belonging to the peasant class of a Jewish carpenter. He even died the most shameful death, a slave's death on the cross during Tiberius' reign. Yet, we have far more reliable written sources closer to the time of Jesus' actual life and death than the Kaiser of Rome. Deny Jesus' existence and be consistent and deny the existence of the famed Roman Emperor too. What do scholars today think about Jesus' existence? Of course, he existed. That's, that's really not in dispute. What's interesting is you have ancient Jewish traditions and recorded in the Talmud and what's called Midrashic literature, and they mention someone called Yeshu, and he's, he's mentioned sometimes in a generation or two before when Jesus lived or a generation or two after, and then the memories seem to be vague. So there's dispute about whether the authors of the Talmud actually knew of this Jesus, did they put him in the wrong place, is this referring to someone else? But as you go further on in Jewish history, when you get to Moses Maimonides in the 12th century, uh, he just plainly talks about Jesus uh, being given over to be killed and so on and, and why Jews don't follow him. So through Jewish history, there's never really been dispute about his existence. I would think Jesus existed. But if I were gonna give just a kind of a general kind of response, uh, I'd say uh, big picture, little picture. Big picture, from uh, about 1990 with the uh, work of Richard Burridge on the Gospels and the predominant view in New Testament study today being that the, that the uh, Gospels are in the genre of Greco-Roman bias or biography. That doesn't mean there can't be anything in there that, you know, it doesn't mean the Greeks and Romans don't tell funny little tales sometimes, but it makes the genre is not a fantasy genre. It's a potentially historical genre. So big picture is, with the Gospels, we got the right data. Oh, that Jesus never existed. It lasts for a little while and then it goes away. That Jesus did exist is very well attested in the historical literature. It is mentioned by a number of non-Christian sources. For example, Jesus is met, mentioned by Josephus. Uh, Tacitus mentions Jesus. Lucian of Samosata mentions him. Marabar Serapian mentions Jesus. The Talmud mentions him. Uh, Josephus mentions the martyrdom of James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ. Again, it's very difficult to have someone who's a brother of someone who did not exist. In addition, we have a number of Christian sources who mention Jesus. We have multiple independent sources with the Gospels. You have Paul, uh, the letters of Paul. 
you have uh, the book of Hebrews, you have other New Testament literature. These are multiple independent sources, and although they're a Christian, you just can't discount them because they're Christian. Those who think that Jesus of Nazareth never existed are well over 100 years out of date. The atheist New Testament scholar, Rod Ehrman. In the, in the crowds you all run around with, it's commonly thought that Jesus did not exist. Let me tell you, once you get outside of your conclave, there's nobody who, I mean, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. It is not an issue for scholars. Of, there is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. Reason for thinking Jesus existed is because he is abundantly attested in early sources. That's why. And I give the details in my book. Uh, early and independent sources uh, indicate that Je certainly that Jesus existed. One author that we know about knew Jesus' brother and knew Jesus' closest disciple, Peter. He's an eyewitness to both Jesus' closest disciple and his brother. From skeptics to Christian New Testament scholars, the existence of Jesus is not in doubt and it is certain that he existed. But some way, somehow, social media professors have figured out everything and they say, You just look foolish. Uh, you are much better off going with historical evidence and arguing historically. Come hang out with me on social media.